Okay, so good afternoon, uh, everybody. My name is Alberto Rossi. I'm an associate professor of finance at Georgetown University, and I'm the associate director of the Cent Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy. Welcome back to the Georgetown Global Virtual FinTech Seminar Series. After the summer break we took in August, so our plan for the fall is going to be to bring you two to three events every month. So stay tuned for information about our upcoming events. So in addition to the FinTech Seminar Series. We are organizing our annual conference. This year is going to be virtual and will take place over the week of November 16th. And um, you're going to find in the chat link, uh, the link to sign up. And we have an incredible lineup of speakers. We're going to have, uh, for example, David Rubinstein, the co-founder and co-chairman of the Carlyle Group. We're going to have Barbara Novik, the vice chairman and co-founder of BlackRock. And then we're going to have many other amazing speakers uh, coming from the private sector and from government. So we all hope that you're going to be able to attend. So today uh, we're going to have a FinTech Apps Day. We have three great speakers, uh, Wen Lan Chan, uh, Francesco da Punto, and Michaela Pagel, and they're going to present their papers that use transaction data and FinTech apps to study how individuals make financial and consumption decisions. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, kind of leave the virtual floor to Wen Lan, who's going to be presenting uh, the paper, The Impact of COVID-19 Pandemic on Consumption, Learning from High-Frequency Transactions Data. And as a reminder, we're going to have uh, um, that Wenlan is going to present uninterrupted for 20 to 25 minutes, and we're going to have five to 10 minutes for questions. And you can raise your hand or write your question in the chat. Wenlan, feel free to share the screen and get started. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Georgetown and Alberto for giving me this great opportunity to present my uh, working paper. So it, it's a great pleasure and I'm looking forward to any comments and feedback. So this paper is, is strictly speaking, not really on FinTech, but I hope that uh, um, I'm able to share with you some sort of new work that I've been doing using sort of a technology based uh, transaction data or technology assisted uh, acquisition of uh, transaction data to understanding something about the COVID-19. So this paper is joined with Hai Chang Chen and uh, Chang Wen, both of them are from Xiamen University in China. So, I mean, the research question, uh, the motivation is very straightforward. Uh, everybody is uh, concerned about the COVID-19, everybody is affected, is uh, hitting worldwide with many infections and many deaths. And uh, the resulting consequences are very uh, obvious and, uh, and we all feel that. So it comes with stringent public health measures and till date, uh, to date uh, we are still discussing about the strict measures that are kind of uh, distancing one from another. And it uh, associated with that impact is the severe economic impact, which is going to hit, uh, which has hit both supply and demand side of the economy with uh, many governments jumping in with um, uh, uh, big uh, stimulus of great, uh, stimul gigantic stimulus packages trying to rescue the economy. And um, in order, I mean, since we're still sort of uh, evolving in this, uh, in the middle of this pandemic, understanding or assessing the economic impact is still very pertinent, but also at the same time challenging, not only because it hits all segments or all aspects of the economy, but, all, but also because it is an unprecedented uh, uh, type of event that uh, can, we cannot readily draw from experience from recent economic crisis. And hence, uh, the more uh, empirical analysis or theoretical analysis will be very helpful in guiding us understanding the nature of the uh, uh, event and also sort of uh, uh, guiding us to uh, uh, guide us with a, a relevant economic policy. Now, the goal of this uh, research uh, paper is actually very simple, is among the, among the several papers or a lot of papers by now, I mean, I believe that Michaela also has a couple of papers on the same topic, the idea is to provide some early facts and also insight on the economic impact of COVID-19. And uh, the approach that we're going to take in this paper is to by drawing on the China's experience. And the reason is um, uh, the following, that it's the first country that experienced a severe outbreak and with a lot of severe lockdown measures. And also what's more, that it's also the country that actually has I mean, by far, it, at least it looks like, or reportedly has sort of the local infections that are under reasonable control. So if you talk to uh, people in China now, or they sort of seems to be able to resume the economic activity or daily life uh, as close to before as possible, okay? 
And the infection um, severity has seems to be under reasonably control from March 2020, which gives us a good uh, case to actually phase a more complete cycle or ra rather sort of a complete cycle of the uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, what we're going to focus on is consumption aspects of economic impact. And even though the China is sort of is mostly investment driven in the previous decade, it's still um, uh, consumption is about 42% of China's GDP in the most recent decade. This is actually a very important part of the economy. Now, specifically, the two questions that we're going to empirically address is one, uh, how large and persistent is the consumption impact and how does the recovery look like uh, throughout this uh, time period that we're investigating? And second, and more importantly, what we're interested in is to understand the variation of the consumption impact, in particular, the relevance or the relationship between consumption impact uh, uh, relative to the uh, epidemic severity, or how does consumption respond to epidemic severity. Hopefully, by addressing these two questions using the transaction data that we have, it can help us shed a little bit of light on the mechanism of what's going on, at least in the context of China. So for example, that we know that because of the uh, public health measures, we have a lot of distancing and mobility restrictions that will directly affect people's ability to consume because people are physically constrained. On the other hand, you can also think that, um, that the COVID-19, because of the unprecedented nature, because of the unknown, uh, many, many unknowns in the equations of understanding about the virus, it itself can actually direct impact people's uh, consumption demand because of the uncertainty and fear and an anxiety associated with the, with the virus. Okay. So hopefully we can say something about uh, the, the, the underlying channels. Now, getting to the data. So what we're gonna do is to use the universe of all the offline spending transactions from the largest uh, or at least one of the largest um, uh, payment service provider, which is called China's uh, Union Pay. Uh, uh, corporation. Now, you can think about a union pay is kind of China's equivalent of Visa and MasterCard. Okay, so Visa and MasterCard actually is not there, is uh, not popular at all. So all the card transactions historically is being transacted using a uh, union pay. And also in the most recent decade, they are also kind of trying to keep update to uh, with technology, which. Uh, means that in addition to using cost machines and swipe cards, they're also going to sort of uh, uh, collect or uh, they're going to uh, process payments using QR methods, QR code, uh, code methods. So essentially it also covers, not only does it cover bank card transactions, but also covers QR code transactions that are used, that are paid by Alipay or WeChat Pay, which are the mo two most dominant kind of a QR payment uh, instruments. Okay, so, and how does it happen? It, the, the picture here basically shows that in the stores that the merchant typically has a scanner machine. And as long as the scanner machine is uh, from the union pay company, then they're gonna use the scan, a scanner machine to scan the QR code on the, on the user's mo mobile phone, which is, can be linked to Alipay or WeChat uh, uh, e-wallet. And such transactions will be recorded as well. Now, how comprehensive is the coverage? In, uh, in 2019, uh, the union pays a database or the company covers 15 trillion MMB in uh, tr and transactions or 9 trillion RMB spending. Okay, so in terms of uh, magnitude, you can think about it, it actually covers 30% of China's entire total offline retail consumption. Now, what's missing here is other methods that are people using to offline uh, spending at offline retailers, for example, people, some people still use, use cash. And some people may use uh, POS machines not, not in a union pays network, or some people may directly use a QR code uh, that's supported by Ali or things like that. Now, in order to make sure that our sample is remains representative or remains actually stable, we actually did some uh, background checks. And to make sure that the market share of union pays offline spending actually stay, stay stable during our sample period, which is a relatively a short horizon. So the market share doesn't move much, which alleviates the concern whether the result, whatever result that we're documenting is actually driven by people's changing uh, payment instruments. The other part that we don't capture in this data is the online uh, spending, okay? Now, I'm not gonna be too worried about this uh, for two reasons. One is that in China, even though the online e-commerce is actually developing very fast, still 70% of the spending actually occurs offline. And also we have some supplementary data set on online spending to complement the analysis that we have to analyze what is the online consumption response. Okay, so the uh, empirical approach is a typical dip and dip analysis. 
So, and uh, we're going to look at the consumption that's aggregated at the city level in 214 cities. So it's not all the cities, but it's all the cities with at least five, uh, 1 million urban population. Now, in terms of economic size, that pretty much covers uh, ni over 90% of China's economy, okay? E either in terms of GDP or in terms of the urban population. The sample period is going to be like roughly speaking 12 weeks uh, after uh, the Wuhan lockdown, okay? We didn't use the Wuhan lockdown as the event date. Since then, that's kind of the essential, the, the, the launch or not launch, the, the starting point of the uh, uh, of coronavirus uh, outbreak. And then as a control group, to, in order to control for seasonality trends that actually occur during the same time period, we're gonna use the same, roughly the same time period in uh, the previous year in 2019 as a control period. Now, instead of using the calendar date, we're gonna use the lunar date because uh, the outbreak is centering around the Chinese New Year, which may create other seasonality uh, because people may be off and people may be spending or not spending because of the Chinese New Year. So that's how we're going to sort of classify the event date and also choose the control time period as well. Um, we control a bunch of fixed effects, like city fixed effects, distance uh, to, to the, uh, or event date fixed effects and the day of the week fixed effects and cluster center at the, at the city level. Now, before I show you the regression result, maybe it's more informative to see the visual pattern of what's going on. So here I'm gonna show you the, the overall pattern of the aggregate spending in, uh, in a sample during the sample period uh, in all cities. This is the full sample. You can see actually the blue line corresponds to 2019 and the red line co corresponds to the event year, which is 2020. Now you see that actually around the event day, there is both a de decrease um, uh, in spending, which is likely attributable to the Chinese New Year because people are on, on break and they went home, they're going home, that not, not, not much uh, spending activity going on. But what you really see is that actually the, uh, the drop in spending is much more significant and persistent in uh, 2020. And only uh, in a much later period of the sample period when you do you see actually a slight reversal of the uh, spending. Now, Wuhan is actually the epicenter of the entire outbreak. Uh, we know that everything starts from Wuhan. And then the pattern you see there is that it actually, it's more severe, it's more striking. The uh, decrease is much more significant. And uh, you can actually see after the, after the outbreak or after the lockdown, the, everything is kind of in, uh, completely flat. And it doesn't even, uh, risk, uh, it, uh, it only starts to come, come back at the very end of the sample period. Now here basically is a regression uh, result of describing or using a regression method to kind of uh, describe the same pattern. The overall spending um, actually drops by 32% during the 12 week period. And now if you decompose the spending into different, uh, into different types of categories, you can see actually consistent with many people's findings or your intuition that the service type of spending are affected the most, okay? Dining, entertainment, travel related and most likely because that we are all suffering from um, some sort of uh, mobility restrictions uh, to certain, uh, to a varying degree. And hence uh, our ability to, con uh, to, to consume service, uh, uh, good, uh, service type of consumption is actually limited. But even within the goods, you actually see that uh, the uh, consumption is severely impacted, especially in durable goods and discretionary items. Now, in terms of uh, aggregate impact, uh, we can do a, some back of the envelope calculation. And uh, as a result of that exercise, the sort of the estimate turns out to be about 1.2% of China's GDP is lost during the 12 week period, as, a, a, as explained by offline uh, consumption alone. Okay, and we're not talking about all the consumption. Uh, yes, and uh, we're not talking about other aspects of the GDP, but still, that gives you an idea that in the 12 week or three month period, that's actually a significant uh, impact in terms of reflected in the consumption impact. Now you may, uh, you may wonder what happens to online spending. People may substitute uh, offline spending to online spending because people may not want to go outside or people may not be able to go outside. And because of the uh, fast development or more advanced development in uh, e-commerce in China, maybe that's a more viable uh, alternative option. And uh, we don't have the, uh, 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 the best data set for measuring online consumption, which will be either WeChat or Alipay. However, we do have the sort of the online uh, service uh, provider side of Union Pay, which is called the sister company, which is called the China Pay. Now they're not the biggest part, they're not capturing the, 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 the 
biggest part of the online spending, but still the market share is not like negligible, it's about 5%. So we are gonna use that data to give us a sense about how online spending actually responds. Now, by, by performing that analysis, which I'm not gonna bore you with all the details, the uh, result is that actually the online spending using this alternative data shows that actually online spending uh, goes down by 13%. It's a lot less compared to the uh, offline spending, but still uh, it, it, it's going, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's still a decrease, okay? So there is not, in other words, the substitution, you see some substitution from offline to online, but still it's not enough to offset. Uh, overall, the spending is still going down. And then if you do the calculation, the total consumption, roughly speaking, uh, is going down by 27% in the 12 week period, which is a, a significant amount. Now in the next, in the remaining part of the uh, uh, talk, I'm gonna just talk about the variation in all the consumption uh, uh, impact through space or through time and how that relates to the epidemic severity. Okay, so in the interest of time, let me just uh, show you the, um, this one basically shows that actually the, uh, in, uh, in, in space, this, uh, the level of the consumption impact is highly correlated with the severity of the epidemic uh, in as measured by the number of cases, okay? And then you can see the map that geographically, geographically it's also the case that overall, pretty much all the cities are hit. 90% uh, of the cities are experiencing uh, uh, over 20% consumption decrease in, during the sample period. And the level is actually correlated with the, uh, the, the epidemic severity. And especially if you look at the middle part, which corresponds to the epicenter of the outbreak, which is uh, Wuhan, also uh, Hubei province, you actually see a greater uh, exposure in terms of uh, consumption impact. Now, how do we make sense of that? Uh, the variation, also the total impact. Now, because of the strong correlation with exposure to COVID-19 cases or severity, there can be different interpretations. One is that the severity is obviously correlated with the, um, uh, the level of the physical constraint. For example, the safe distancing and mobility restrictions is higher uh, in the uh, more severely hit uh, uh, places. And therefore the spending is going to be more severely uh, reduced. And also because of the, all those restrictions, you might imagine that people have a bigger, uh, greater negative income shocks in those type of cities as well. So that can be one explanation. The other explanation is the direct impact of COVID-19 as I explained uh, earlier, as I was conjecturing earlier, that because there are so many unknowns in the equation, we don't know much about the coronavirus, there is no known cure and we're still waiting for the vaccine. So it's natural to expect that people may be anxious or uh, fearful and they, uh, there's a great a deal of uncertainty re regarding the evolution or, or the, the path of the uh, a pandemic. And such an uncertainty can itself induce uh, or can uh, induce people to sort of withdraw from their spending even without any economic uh, threat. I'm not saying there is no sort of economic impact, but I'm saying there will be an independent, there likely is an independent effect associated with the huge uncertainty associated with the pandemic, okay? And how are we gonna do that? So there are two approaches that we're gonna use. One is to sort of uh, make, sense, make use of the idea that actually we're gonna use very high frequency changes in the epidemic se severity and try to see how does a daily spending actually respond to daily changes in epidemic severity. Now, the idea, the underlying assumption is that the uh, mobility restrictions or the macroeconomic condition doesn't move uh, on a daily basis or doesn't move as quickly on a daily basis as the epidemic severity. So then by looking at this very high frequency variation, the most likely variation that we're capturing is the, the one that's driven by this uh, epidemic severity, not by the mobility restrictions or the macroeconomic condition. Okay, and the other one, we're gonna use an event study to, uh, to use basically a regression discontinuity approach to look at how sort of a consumption responds to a, a sort of an event that actually alleviates the uncertainty. So by using several proxies of epidemic severity, for example, the number of cases or, uh, or the hospital capacity or number of deaths, all you can see actually, the consumption actually responds very significantly on a daily basis to uh, changes in those epidemic severity. So in, to interpret that means basically, if you see a, a, a big increase in the number of cases yesterday, what you see is that immediately today, the consumption is going to experience a, a, a decline and so on and so forth. Now to add to that evidence that we actually look at, we use sort of a, a event 
which is the official announcement uh, by the Chinese uh, officials about the effectiveness of uh, traditional, several traditional Chinese medicines, uh, TCM, as an effective treatment of mild cases of COVID-19, okay? I'm not saying that this is scientifically, has, is definitely proven to be effective. All I need for identification purposes is that perception-wise, it creates the perception that it actually alleviates the, uh, the, the, the concerns about uh, COVID-19. Now, how do I know that? Uh, because we can basically look at the capital markets response. On the day of the official announcement, there is significant uh, stock market reaction. So for example, one of the very famous uh, drug uh, maker of those uh, TCM experienced a 10% increase in uh, stock returns, even in half day. And then uh, we only observe 10% because uh, China has a, a price limit, so it cannot go further. So it's immediately jump uh, to the roof and which is a strong indication that the market is very perceptive or receptive to the idea and it actually alleviates the uncertainty. Now, what we do is actually to perform an RD analysis in a seven day window uh, around the announcement. So we actually double check there's no other confounding events in the short window. And also I think it's very likely that mobility restrictions or macro conditions doesn't change in a seven day window and especially correspond to the announcement of the, uh, uh, the, the medicine. So it will have to actually help support a causal interpretation of the effect of uncertainty on consumption. So what we find is that there's a sharp increase in offline spending by 23% after announcement of the medicine. And that the result is actually robust. Okay, so in the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about the recovery or the overall trajectory of the consumption. You can actually see there is a sort of like kind of a, a cycle of consumption, the uh, 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 trajectory. So in the first month after the outbreak, you actually see the consumption is the most severely hit. It actually goes down as low as 65% below the baseline uh, during the first uh, three weeks. And then since the uh, fourth week, you actually see that the spending starts to slowly reverse and it continues to uh, 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 recover. And this recovery trajectory happened to, I mean, visually you can also see and regression, we also confirm that the trajectory actually seems to be correlated or trace the epidemic or the number of cases. So when the, when the epidemic curve starts to flatten out, you actually see that the uh, 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 recovery actually also starts to, um, uh, or the consumption starts to recover. Now, what's interesting is in the, by, by the end of March, which is uh, the highest point here, the consumption, the offline consumption as captured by Yin and Tate is already kind of back to the baseline before it actually went down again. Now, remember, uh, I want to highlight two points is that in the last two weeks, which is the circled uh, points here, the most of the cities, the mobility restrictions have been re uh, removed or alleviated. So it's not driven by the uh, sort of a tightening of uh, distancing measures or the supply constraints. And second of all, we know that, I um, mean, we also double check that in the last few weeks, since the beginning of April, there is a sort of a heightened a kind of a concern of a second wave of uh, uh, infections, especially the asymptomatic cases. Actually, the concern starts since then. And there, uh, that uh, we think actually is highly likely to be the reason that explains actually the drop in, con in spending again in the, in, the, in, the, in the last two weeks of the sample period. And then the regression analysis seems to also confirm this sort of a visual pattern. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, show you the sort of a, in terms of space, how does it evolve over time? So this is basically gives you the map, uh, the geographical, uh, the heat map of the consumption impact over the three month period. And then this is the first month, the second month and the third month. So you actually see the negative consumption impact is concentrated in the first month and it starts to alleviate in the second month since the color turns uh, less red or uh, less intense and it starts to kind of a turn pale or even white. And in, and in the last period, what you actually observe is that a lot of the cities, the uh, consumption is already kind of uh, back to normal. I mean, except for, for example, Wuhan or Hubei, a couple of other cities, but many of the cities have gone back to normal, which is uh, consistent with the sort of a dynamic pattern that I showed you uh, before. Okay, so lastly, we also investigate this whole sort of a consumption trajectory, whether it's, a uh, the variation in space, whether it correlated with exposure to the economic uh, impact. Okay, so the way we do this is do two subsample analysis 
One, the first one is to cut the sample by the reliance or on the concentration of service industry. Okay, so we believe, for example, that the cities with a high concentration on service industry should be more affected, right? So if it's actually the supply constraints and the uh, the corresponding effects associated with the supply constraints that's driving the result, we should see a disparity in the in the consumption trajectory among those two cities. Yet, if you sort of do uh, this uh, subsample and plot the consumption trajectory in the two subsample of cities, you don't see a, 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 a salient differences. And you can also test and do a perform a more rigorous uh, statistical test. And I cannot reject that the two uh, paths are, 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 are the same. The second sort of a subsample is to rely on the city's a, a dependence on export, especially this is uh, relevant to understand the, uh, the consumption impact in the later sample of the period when other parts of the world are also sort of a delving into the pandemic, especially for example, starting from week, uh, I don't know, maybe six or eight, where in, that's like in March, uh, where I know we know that uh, Europe and the US is also kind of uh, severely hit. So then you would think that the economic factors will manifest potentially more in the cities with more export dependence. And by this subsample, we also don't see a, a strong uh, difference across the two sub, uh, subsamples. Again, those are the, basically the evidence that seems to suggest that the, uh, the, uh, there's something beyond uh, the, the supply constraints or the impact of uh, mobility constraints or the negative income shocks or economic impact. It seems that uh, the, uh, the, the collective evidence points to the idea that actually um, the uh, uncertainty seems to play a role and seems to be a unique factor describing um, the uh, crisis that we are experiencing. Okay, to wrap up, so the key takeaway, first of all, it's a very severe uh, impact in, as measured by consumption. I think this has been uh, documented in many places. And uh, what, what, what I think is uh, kind of, uh, uh, relatively uh, sort of a unique in this uh, paper is the strong negative sensitivity, the finding that we have about strong se uh, negative sensitivity to the epidemics uh, severity that cannot be fully explained by mobility restrictions or, or macroeconomic uh, influence or exposure. So, and uh, consumption recovery appears to trace the uh, virus containment progress. So it, the, the, the message that we draw from the evidence is that actually effective public health interventions are actually crucial. So it should not be considered as merely kind of a counter, counterproductive uh, or as a um, impeding factor for economic uh, recovery. Actually, it's actually very crucial for reinvigorating the economy because um, without the public health interventions, the huge uncertainty still will remain and the demand, uh, you likely see a withdrawn demand, which is going to prolong the recession and the crisis. And we have done some uh, back of the envelope calculation to actually show that the, uh, the, uh, there is a significant, a significant economic value through the lesson uh, of uh, public health interventions through lessons, through both a, a smaller and negative consumption impact and a faster economic recovery. And the benefit is actually quite sizable. And that's all. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to the comments and questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Werner, for the great presentation. So we have a, a number of uh, questions in the chat. The first one comes from Zun Liu, who is asking, do you have demographic distribution of the people using union pay? He says, my guess is it's a slightly biased over young and mid-age population. Uh, I don't have that uh, in the data because in the data, what we observe is actually just the transaction, uh, transaction uh, information, not the demographics. Actually, not, not in this data, but I've used the union pay before. So in the previous time where we actually do observe the demographics, so you're right that actually that uh, the average cardholder's age is around 30 something. Okay, so I definitely it's not going to capture, it's not going to be the most representative. Uh, and also you might imagine that the poorest people may not use and the rural population may not use this. And also, for, but let me also put it this way. This is not only credit card, this is also mm -hmm. debit card. So in that sense, it's not that biased because my parents are in their seventies. They don't use credit cards, but uh, okay. they all use their debit cards. Okay, so they okay. use their debit cards in, in spending. So, so that is uh, going to uh, create less bias. And also just to one, one more thing, which is I, I suspect that the bias is actually created an underestimate because we're not capturing, most likely not capturing the users who are kind of using cash a lot. 
And I would suspect that the cash users would uh, cut their spending even more because of the, uh, the, the fear and the risk of using cash on top of the, the other factors that we have talked about in this case. I see. So the second question uh, come from Tobin Haspel, who was asking, it will be interesting to learn about the extensive margin when we talk about substitution. So who's driving the substitution effect? More spending from young users who you normally use online payment or net new customers? I guess, I don't know if you can answer. Yes, yeah, so I hope I can have the data to answer that. So in, mm. in yeah, I don't, I don't observe the demographics given, look here, basically we are actually aggregating the data at the city level. So this is basically yeah. the in universe of all the unit pay and uh, they don't, they're not the best kind of a data provider in terms of measuring the user demographics. In future, that will be a good question going forward. I see. So, and then the last question before we move on to the next paper from uh, Xing Zhang is uh, asking, uh, always related. So, does uh, the data contain the online consumption uh, dealt through uh, the union pay cards linked to Alipay or WeChat Pay or not? So, I don't know if this is a question about the offline spending or the online. Spending. So, let me answer that in the following way. So, the mm -hmm. offline spending that we have actually captures the offline spending, even if you're using WeChat or Alipay, as long mm -hmm. as you use, uh, use a QR code that's captured by Union Pay's QR scanners, it's in our database, okay? So it's not only about the card. It's, uh, when you use uh, Alipay, it's also there. Online spending, I believe that's the, uh, the, the data is capturing the, the online spending through the Union Pay's uh, infrastructure. So the Alipay mm -hmm. or WeChat's uh, online spending is not captured in the database. I see, I see. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Wanda, for the great presentation. Much. Yeah, uh, we're going to move on to the second presenter. It's going to be Francesco da Junto. Francesco, feel free to start sharing your screen. Yes, and, uh, screen. and the title of the paper is Crowdsourcing Peer Information to Change Spending Behavior. You can go ahead. Great. So thank you. Uh, let me thank you very much for having me. And you know, the organizer is also <laughs> a co-author of the paper. So maybe that was uh, made it a, a bit easier in a sense. So before... I move on to present this paper, which is joint work indeed with Albert and with uh, Michael Weber at the University of Chicago. Just wanted to give a couple of words of why do I believe the fintech apps and fintech research in general is really important and uh, interesting as an error research uh, right now. So I often get asked by colleagues or people just, uh, you know, in, in the real world, what is really fintech research? So very recently I've been sort of thinking a bit harder about it for a review paper I'm writing, I really think, I mean, it's not really that we should think that anything that uh, refers to applying technology in finance is uh, fintech research. Like we've had technology in finance since uh, at least the ancient Romans who were inventing uh, uh, money and coins and so on and so forth. Uh, and so I think, I mean, a defining feature of fintech research instead is the fact that for the first time in finance, we have uh, the use of big and open data that are diffused already in other fields and areas such as computer science or others. Uh, and so in particular, the way I like to think about it is this notion of the five rings of fintech research. So we can see the two of these rings, the blue ring and the green ring, refer to the fact that fintech research is all the research that either uses existing theoretical and empirical instruments to understand uh, big and open data and finance, so this would be a lot of work that has been done recently in applying machine learning techniques, region lasso regressions, textual analysis. For instance, Michael, our co-author, is working in this area, Alberto himself, uh, Will Song, and, and many, many others, probably even in the audience. Um, so the idea here is that some of these techniques have always been there. They've been there for decades, but they've never been applied to finance data because we still didn't have a need for those. We still didn't have big and open data in finance. Uh, the second way in which this uh, uh, sort of research is crucial is in developing empirical and theoretical paradigms that are completely new. For instance, the idea of blockchain technology and applying this paradigm to finance questions. Now, apart from these two rings, what I call instead the other three rings, I believe really completely uh, uh, are based on research on fintech apps. So I do believe that that's why fintech apps are very peculiar and important in terms of bringing uh, 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 the agenda of fintech going forward. And so in particular here, I'm talking about this red ring, which is the notion of uh, using apps because apps allow us to give individuals, households, consumers, information that they didn't have before 
but it would have been very hard for them to gather on their own. And so this brings to the notion and the role of uh, financial advice or other forms of advice, for instance, robot advising, income aggregators, and so on and so forth. A second completely opposite way in which we can think about the use of fintech apps is the purple ring here, which is instead uh, for researchers and for marketers, for those that are in the private sector, eliciting information from households that otherwise would have been very hard for us to have in traditional settings. And instead here, we can easily obtain by accessing households directly, easily uh, on uh, their phones, on their apps. And then finally, the uh, yellow ring, which is the idea that apps allow a very easy technologically uh, and logistically feasible disintermediation uh, of capital allocations, such as peer-to-peer -peer lending and crowdfunding. I really want to uh, emphasize then, given this is the, the topic of the day in a bit more of a high level or broader uh, way, that we can think about these uh, three crucial notions in which apps are important for fintech research. Uh, for the first uh, uh, work, for instance, I mean, with, uh, together with Alberto, we have a very recent uh, uh, survey entitled Robot Advising, indeed, which reviews the ways in which information can be displayed uh, to consumers and households through apps and also thinks about some open questions that are open both in terms of research and more broadly for the future. And, you know, there's been work on this, uh, for instance, Michaela, who's here with us today, she has uh, among the very first papers using income aggregators, uh, recently Yaron Levy and Nars and others. So, so this is the area in which today's paper that I will move on to discuss in a minute uh, uh, falls. So the idea that we can use app to provide individuals with information uh, and advising that otherwise they wouldn't have. And of course, there's been also work very recently, and I think it's a very frontier uh, era research in terms of the idea of uh, using apps to elicit new info about households. We have some work with uh, Michael Weber, uh, Rauter and Scheuch uh, uh, using uh, an app in, in Germany where we do reach out to households to elicit their beliefs, uh, what they think about the future, so how do they make their financial decisions uh, uh, right on time. And then finally, also in the, in the area of disintermediation, both in terms of payment, uh, wallet payments, for instance, and lending transactions. So uh, uh, Wenland's paper falls in here. She also has earlier work on mobile wallet, uh, and uh, many others are also working in this area. All right, so after this kind of uh, a general overview, which I, which I hope might be interesting uh, for some of you that have, uh, are starting to think about this area uh, uh, for their own research, uh, let's jump to the paper. So the motivation for our paper today is one of the broadest questions in uh, household finance. The problem that low savings often limit the wealth accumulation of households uh, for retirement. And so we have households that get to the time of retirement without enough uh, wealth to guarantee the, their maintenance of the same standards of living they had while working. And several factors and uh, um, ideas have been proposed to think about this, uh, this question, both on the rational side and on in the non standard side. But one common point to all these uh, potential uh, stories is the fact that we have to recognize households have very little information about what their optimal savings rate should be. So in most cases, most households, if I think about, for instance, my parents, have never really thought about this question and they've never been educated to think about this question. So they wouldn't really know exactly what's the optimal way for them to save for retirement. So as it happens in many uh, decisions that people start to do when they have to learn something, uh, it often happens that even for uh, saving decisions, we would look at what others are doing. And potentially we try to infer what the optimal savings rate should be for us based on what we observe in the real world, other people that look similar to us are doing. Now, this uh, type of behavior, which is very common, uh, faces this potential problem of uh, visibility bias. There was recently a uh, theory uh, put in a theory and uh, um, uh, proposed by Han, Schleifer and Walden. So what's the idea here is that if we really make inferences about what's optimal for us to do based on others spending decisions, uh, the problem is that typically the most conspicuous part of people's uh, spending choices is visible. Uh, um, we would end up then overestimating what others are really spending in real life because we don't see every single instance of their spending, but we typically only observe the situation that the other people want to show off to us. Uh, expensive cars, expensive lifestyle, and so on and so forth. 
Now, this problem is especially bad at times of social media, so in situations in which indeed visibility bias is exactly what drives the old notion of uh, probably being on social media. And so here, you know, my course or Michael probably won't be happy about it, but we always like uh, to take him as a very good example because uh, we can see, for instance, I mean, if you have an Instagram account, uh, so this is a picture that I took of, uh, you know, him uh, having a very expensive uh, 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 sparkling uh, wine, champagne, actually, on a very nice sand deck, enjoying life. So that's the type of picture you would show uh, to people that know you, like the very, very uh, conspicuous consumption you have. But then all your Instagram uh, uh, contacts wouldn't see that mostly every single night, in fact, the type of dinner you might have is a very, very simple and cheap dinner. For instance, in this case, like this uh, uh, German sausage and lettuce. And so by only observing the most conspicuous part of consumption, people might overestimate uh, what is the spending that their peers are doing. So if this type of bias exists in the real world, how do we detect it and how can we correct for this bias? Well, the idea, the most uh, uh, relevant uh, and direct point would be to provide people with the evidence about their overall amount uh, of spending of uh, uh, the peers. So not only the instances where they drink champagne, but also every single day when they have much cheaper uh, means. Now, of course, it's very difficult to implement this information provision uh, to all households in a representative population with traditional tools. And that's where uh, this paper comes in and uh, the company that we, uh, uh, for which we get the data. So we work with data from an income aggregator app, uh, application, which is called Status Money. And the idea of this income aggregator that is that on top of the typical income aggregating functions, uh, the app also provides information about the spending of similar individuals to the users of the account, which they call peers. Now, uh, I would like to stress that these are not peers in the, in the sense of uh, social peers. So individuals that the users of the account know in their real life. But as we will see later, these are peers defined based on demographic characteristics and based on data coming from a representative uh, US population. And so what we ask then is, do users react to this information at all? If people were not overestimating what the peers are spending, they wouldn't react to this information because they already knew this information beforehand. To the contrary, they would react if they were estimating this information badly, potentially, before. And so what we find, just to give you a rough idea of the raw data results, and then we will go in detail about interpreting it. So here I'm showing you a scatter bin plot. Uh, of uh, all our users. So each of these bin includes about 250 users of the app. And I'm sorting these users on the x-axis based on whether at the time when they signed up to the app, they were spending more than their peers. So these would be all the people on the right uh, of this vertical line here. So this uh, we will call overspenders in the sense that we're spending more than the, what we call the peers. And those that were spending less than the peers. Now we can see that for the overspenders, there is a substantial cut in their spending in the months after uh, accessing the app. And so after having observed the information about the peer spending relative to before. There is also a slight increase in spending, so a slight catching up for those that were spending less, but this effect seems to be asymmetric. Now, of course, this is only raw data. So there's several issues that might arise at this point, for instance, mean reversion in spending and so on and so forth. So we will go into the details of how we think about this, uh, these problems. But let me give you a couple of uh, pieces of information more about the app, uh, how it's designed that will be important and crucial for interpreting the results. So when people sign up to the app, they provide all the information they typically provide to any income aggregator, annual income age, uh, uh, home ownership status and so on and so forth. They also provide the social security numbers so that the accounts uh, can uh, and the transactions in their bank accounts can be downloaded. And of course, they link the potential debit and credit accounts and retirement and savings accounts. Now, the incentive to link these accounts in the app is the fact that uh, that's why people are signing up because they want to have an aggregation of their balance sheet. So uh, we would expect that people tend to link the accounts because that's why they were signing to the app to begin with. But now, of course, in the analysis, we will also look at the effects on different subsamples, including people that we know have linked several accounts 
threat to people that have linked less accounts to make sure that the accounts you are looking at are really true people that are using the app. So this is uh, what the uh, people see after they've provided their information. So after providing the information, they will be uh, assigned to one of a set of pre-specified peer groups, which try to uh, mimic, to create demographic uh, groups of similar characteristics. Now you can see, for instance, in this case, this is a person of 42 years old uh, uh, that has an income of under $40,000 living in New York City, because it's an urban type and the credit score is about 770. Now the characteristics of the peer group that is already pre-specified based on external data, uh, so not based on within the app, but based on representative Equifax data, uh, uh, provides uh, people of uh, an age range between 40 and 49, an income range between 100 and 150, and other characteristics uh, that tend to be seen. Now, I would like to stress already here that, as you can see, some of these groups are actually not similar to the individual account user at all. Think about the income range, for instance. So here we have an income range between 100 and $150,000. Of course, spending will be completely different based on whether you are earning something at the uh, two extremes of this income range. And that's exactly a feature of the app that we will exploit later to test for whether when peer groups are more informative, so they are more tightly linked and tightly characterized on the characteristics of the user, do people react to information more? In those cases, relative than in a case like the one I'm showing you where potentially the peer group is loser. We will see that indeed, the do people react more to peer groups that are more informative. Uh, so this is the second picture I wanted to show you because it shows you what was the most vivid thing that the authors, that the, the users uh, see when they sign up. So the blue line represents what is the spending uh, over the month uh, for the individual account users based on their transactions. And this is compared to uh, uh, um, uh, an estimate, an uh, average of what is the, peer, the spending of the peers over the month. This is a linear estimate, as you can see, so it doesn't change from day to day, as well as the national uh, average. So this is really the kind of treatment effect or information effect the app might have on individuals, showing them very vividly whether they're spending more or less than the peers and also other pieces of information that we will talk about uh, later. So I will not spend time given, uh, uh, um, uh, we don't have much time in terms of the summary statistics, as you would expect, these uh, samples as usual, they're typically a bit more uh, um, uh, representative of younger populations and men uh, that typically access this type of apps. But just to get a sense of do this data make sense in terms of the transactions we observe, just wanted to show you some examples. So first of all, when I showed you this uh, first graph at the beginning, it seems that people are cutting their spending more uh, uh, if they are overspenders, what we find is that this pattern is completely driven in the raw data by discretionary spending, which includes exactly the type of spending that we think people could change easily from one month to the other. Outside food and drinks, clothes, entertainments, and so on and so forth. When we instead we look at non-discretionary spending, such as groceries, which in large part is incompressible spending, but also fees, mortgage payments, tuitions for those that are students in college, we can see that actually the reaction uh, is completely flat. So we think that makes sense in uh, uh, telling us that, uh, uh, you know, it's not really that we are capturing potentially some uh, effect uh, like uh, the linking of accounts or whatever happens. It's really only the expenses that can change. That we can. And also we find that one of the categories that uh, changes in uh, this fashion is cash withdrawals. Why do we care about cash withdrawals? Because for the case of cash withdrawals, we don't need to allocate uh, this specific transaction to a chapter of expense. Uh, so because this is based on an algorithm, of course, in all these apps, the algorithm might be inefficient or might be uh, uh, you know, wrong or, or problematic. For cash withdrawals, this is certain. We know that this is the amount of money that has been taken out of uh, the ATM. And so we see that indeed, even for this case where no categorization is needed, the pattern is similar. So then in terms of the baseline results, basically what we do is I'm just running in a multivariate setting uh, what I showed you in the graph at the very beginning. So I will go a bit faster in here. I only want to emphasize that what we are controlling for in the multivariate setting is the amount of spending that these individuals had 
up to the time in which they signed up uh, to status. So this is a kind of a direct way uh, to account for the potential of mean reversion uh, in spending of individuals. So one might be worried, it's actually a very important worry for the type of study we are doing, that maybe those people that are categorized as overspenders at the beginning are just people that ended up for some reason spending more than what they normally spend uh, in the days before sign up. Now, of course, then by construction, we would observe that these people drop their spending after uh, uh, they have signed up, but they haven't really cut anything. It's just that the, the anomaly was their behavior before signing up. And so by controlling directly for the spending before, uh, we want to absorb this uh, potential for mean reversion. We see that indeed we do find a substantial amount of mean reversion in the data. You see that both of these coefficients are negative, uh, for people that are below and above the data. So both people that end up being above and below actually have a lot of mean reversion over time. They can they reduce spending after times in which their spending was high, but this doesn't in any way uh, affect the estimate of the reaction to the information we observe. All right, so of course, uh, uh, the adoption of this uh, technology is completely endogenous. So these people decided for some reason they wanted to take it up, Potentially, maybe they were already overseeing that they were spending too much. So, you know, it's like with a diet, they might think about, I anyway will lose weight. Let me just pick one of these diets, but uh, it's not a treatment effect for the diet per se. Potentially, I would have uh, lost weight anyway. And also, of course, this problem of mean reversion is still potentially, you know, we might see that uh, even if we control for pre spending, we want to have more uh, evidence that there's no mean reversion going on driving the results. And so to address these issues, what we do is we exploit a, a specific setting in the app, which provides an identification strategy. In particular, the fact that the app is assigning uh, users to peer groups based on pre-specified uh, income cutoffs. So in particular, if your income is just below a certain cutoff, you are assigned to a certain type of groups. If your income is just above a certain cutoff, you are assigned to another type of peer groups. So we have the cutoffs. I'm writing it down here what their values are for five of these values. What's the idea then? If you just stand uh, slightly above the cutoff, what you will have is that you will see people that uh, are spending quite a lot and typically more than you because the average spending of the peers is based on people that actually have a much higher range of income relative to you. If instead you happen to be just below the cutoff, then you are at the very extreme of the uh, um, of this uh, range of uh, peer incomes uh, towards the right, so you are among the highest income earners in your group, which means that typically you will observe uh, peer groups that are spending less than you. And so we can compare people that are to the uh, close to these two cutoffs, but they, they are definitely then similar in other characteristics, but they are provided with different information relative to the uh, spending of the peers. Here I'm showing you just an, as, a, an, as an example what happens to the income of these individuals around the cutoff. So here I'm sorting the average of uh, income of individuals for different values of uh, income before signing up to the app. In this case, the cutoff is $50,000. And you can see that when we look at the average spending on the y-axis for these individuals before signing up, basically this spending is not different either just before, below, and just above the cutoff, which is a very direct way uh, to uh, sort of dismiss the potential mean reversion uh, problem driving the results because here, there, if, even if there was any mean reversion, that would be exactly identical for everybody because they're all spending exactly the same uh, before signing up. And in the paper, of course, we also have a more formal, we have added recently more formal balancing of uh, other demographic characteristics. So we exploit this uh, quasi-random assignment to groups in a, a standard two-stage least square specification where in the first stage we use the assignment uh, to being just above the cutoff uh, to instrument for the amount of peer spending you see. Uh, so uh, if you are in the dummy above, you will see people that spend more. And then we will use this instrument of peer spending to test for the change in spending at the individual level. And what we find for both stages is indeed results in line with uh, what we had in mind. So uh, uh, in the first stage, if you end up being just above the cutoff, you do indeed observe people that have peer spending higher uh, relative to those that were uh, falling just below the cutoff. That's by construction. If uh, the story I told you earlier about how the app works uh, is true, 
Uh, and in the second stage, when we use this instrumented value, indeed, we find a positive coefficient, which means that if you are below the cutoff and you observe people that are spending less than you, uh, 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 then you will uh, actually cut quite substantially. If you are above the cutoff and you see people that are spending more than you, you will not cut at all, or if anything, you will increase a bit. And so the difference between these two is positive, as we see uh, in these uh, second stage results. Now, as I mentioned and alluded to earlier when describing the app, we actually have an uh, uh, interesting setting here in the sense that we can exploit the fact that certain people uh, will be assigned to groups and peer groups that are more similar to them and certain people to peer groups that are less similar to them. So do we observe any differential reaction? Well, if the story we are trying to interpret uh, here is meaningful, we should observe that people tend to especially react when they are compared to peer groups that are very similar to them, because those groups are more informative regarding potentially what the individual should do with their savings. And that's exactly what we see across a large set of uh, uh, heterogeneity uh, tests based on these uh, uh, similarities and differences between the individual and the peer group. I will not go into the details, uh, uh, given that I'm almost running out of time, but you know, for uh, all the way we can find in the app to do that, uh, uh, that's what we find. A second heterogeneity very briefly I wanted to show you is that what we find is that people that are on average lower income, they tend to react much more to this information relative to higher income users. Now, of course, here in the app, uh, we don't have people with really extremely low income, as we would think about it in the US, for instance, um, because in order to sign up for this app, you need to have at least an investment account, you, know, you need to have a smartphone. So the lowest income group is uh, closer to the median income in the US. We see that the size of the reaction for this group is pretty large. As we look at people that have higher and higher income, as I'm showing you here, instead, uh, the sensitivity of this reaction drops quite substantially. To the extent that people in the highest income group, which are exactly the ones that probably would think they don't care uh, for uh, uh, their spending uh, so much, because anyway, they have enough uh, retirement uh, uh, wealth, uh, they barely react. Very, very last uh, point, uh, I mean, in uh, a minute, uh, refers to uh, the external validity. So uh, we discuss about the fact that people take up these apps endogenously. Another big issue is that, of course, given that this app is uh, marketed as an app that gives you information about peers, we might worry that the people that are signing up are people that for some reason are really sensitive to information about peers. But that then, if we were thinking about the overall population, the general population, these effects wouldn't might maybe happen because the other people don't care at all. Now, of course, this is uh, still not invalidating the internal validity of the results I showed you before, but it's uh, obviously an issue of external validity. Would this uh, uh, intervention have an effect if we were enlarging it to a broader population? And so in order to tackle this question, what we thought and decided to do is a randomized control trial uh, so we do it with an online platform, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, and so what we do is uh, um, a setting which is quite similar to what happens in the status uh, app. So I cannot go into the details because we don't have enough time. Uh, this would need potentially a, a, a presentation of its own. But just to show you here, so I'm plotting the IP addresses of the people that participate to our RCT, you can see that this is the shape of the United States. We get people from basically all over the US. It's a pretty representative population also when we look at demographics. And what I can tell you is that even within this group, we uh, sort of uh, uh, replicate, uh, uh, of course, uh, changing the differences uh, um, that are needed for, for this uh, uh, variation, a similar pattern as we had with status. So the overspenders, relative to uh, the information we give them, tend to actually uh, believe they should spend less uh, going forward. All right, so I think my, my time is really up right now. So just uh, 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 the only thing to wrap up, I believe that this is an instance in which we can see how FinTech apps are important to provide people information, especially provide advice potentially. Uh, and so uh, in particular, these are robot advising, in this case, robot advising for consumption or robot advising for investment. Uh, is potentially one of the crucial ways in which fintech research can actually uh, change the way we think about household uh, uh, finance and individual investors. So thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, Francesco. I think that uh, we have only one minute for 
questions. I, I'm going to just collect two questions, one from Gustavo Schwenkler and one from Will Song that are very similar in spirit. So Gustavo is saying that uh, uh, Johannes Strobel has a paper showing that friends influences, uh, influence uh, consumption choices. And Will Song saying, when I think about peer effects, I feel the identity of the peers play a role on social networks. So if I get an anonymous group of peers, the effect would be different from the ones I, the peers instead I interact with. So he's uh, saying, how do you kind of think about these two different uh, types of peer effects? What are you disentangling by using kind of peers that are not friends? Yeah, so this is an, an extremely important question. And thanks to you both for doing it, even because normally indeed, when we think about the peer effects, we think about the social network dimension, which is the one you both refer to. Uh, so what we instead want to understand here is not really whether these people are influencing each other behavior because they want to sort of copy each other or to, uh, you know, there is some kind of a keeping up with the Joneses effect, which is the most traditional way in which we think about peer effects. What we are about to hear is only indeed this notion of information about what should I do and what should I not do. So because in this setting, we think we can really disentangle in the setting, we have these two alternative ways to think about providing information about what you might think is a good, uh, something you should do relative to having a social interaction with other people. And we can do it very explicitly on this platform because first of all, uh, as we mentioned, the information about the peers is completely anonymous and unrelated to these individuals. And second, crucially, the peers will never observe the reaction of the individuals, the users of the app. So because of these two crucial differences, that's why what we have here is not like the typical traditional kind of keeping up with the Joneses uh, uh, um, sort of idea of peer effects. We have been studying uh, in econ and finance, but it's really that you're providing information regarding what you should do or advising individuals regarding uh, one of the uh, potential uh, object of decision-making of which they are not really well aware on their own. They, they, they cannot really infer an optimal spending if they are not able to solve a pretty complicated uh, 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 dynamic planning problem. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Francesco. So let's uh, move on to the next presentation. So I have Michaela. Uh, I can, wait a second. I, I think you can now speak. Okay, are you able to share your screen or does it say that you're not? Um, no. Sorry. I think so. Yeah. I think you have so to I make think, me a co-host. Yeah, I think the problem is that yeah. I am a co-host myself. I'm not the host. So Anna, um, Anna Cormis, if you can make uh, Michaela a co-host. Okay, now you're a co-host. You can go ahead. And uh, so the, the last paper is um, Michaela Tagel presenting the paper Bumped, the effects of stock ownership on uh, individual spending. Um, Michaela, please uh, feel free to go ahead. Hey, thank you so much for including my paper in the program. And this is joined by with Paulina and Medina. No, which are, I think we, we can hear you very poorly. I mean, at least I hear you very poorly. Uh, okay. Try to speak. I think um, it's your headphones. Maybe I can change the... I think you may want to use them. The, like yeah, I can uh, probably use the... Microphone from the laptop. Yeah. Does it work better now? Much yeah, better. Yeah, yeah, much better. So, um, d does it work better now? Yeah, it works much, much better. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Perfect. So, this joint work was Paulina Medina from Texas A&M and then Vrinda Mittal, who's a PhD student at Columbia. And she's here and is going to also answer questions in the chat on the fly. You just put this in full screen. There we go. Perfect. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we are interested in how stock rewards and stock ownership affects spending. So the ideal experiment that we would like to do is people walk down the street and then we hand them stocks of a certain brand, say Starbucks, and uh, then we see do they spend more at Starbucks or not. And in principle, if we kind of think about a, a classical econ model like the CAPM, then whether or not somebody owns Starbucks should not affect his or her spending at all because 
my portfolio choice is just investing into the market. Um, and, you know, it, it shouldn't be uh, in that sense determined by, by my spending or determine my spending. However, we know that there are biases in investing. So we know that people like to invest into stocks that are, they are familiar with. And we think there's also something going on, like people think they affect the company with their actions, maybe um, in, in a way when they spend at the company that they own stocks, that in some sense that is good for them. Uh, and then we also know that if you market to investors, then that boosts sales. So we also think there's a, a investor spending kind of um, link. And in our setting that I'm going to show you in a, uh, in a second, there's also something else uh, going on, which could be gift exchange in the sense that when you hand people stock of a certain company, maybe they perceive that as a gift and they want to be nice to that company in response. Okay, so again, um, ideal experiment is like what happens if you hand somebody um, stock. So we don't have that perfect experiment. So what we do have is data from a FinTech app and people sign up to that app and they link all of their checking accounts and all of their credit cards accounts. And then they, when they shop at certain brands that they select in advance, for example, in coffee, they can select Starbucks or Duncan and then they select Dun uh, Starbucks, say. Um, and then if they then shop at Starbucks, they receive stock. So, and this is, not, of course, not the ideal experiment that we were thinking of, but we have two kind of um, advantages in this setting that we can use to take a step towards this ideal experiment. So, the bumped brokerage accounts are distributed over time. So, people sign up for a wait list originally, and then at some point in time, they receive the bumped brokerage account, and we only use people who are then signing up right away in the week that they are allowed to sign up. And then they pick like Starbucks or Duncan, and then we look at um, do they increase their spending at Starbucks if they, if they picked Starbucks. And then we also have a nice feature in the setting, which is that when people signed up, then randomly some of them got stock grants. So some of them received Starbucks stock as a grant, like five or ten dollars, into their brokerage accounts, and then we can look at what happens to their to their spending. So, and what we find is that people spend forty percent more um, in the elected brands when they receive the bumped accounts, and when they receive a bumped stock grant, they spend one hundred twenty percent more in those granted brands. So our papers like related to um, a bunch of other papers in the literature, it's as um, Francesco described so well, it is falling into, I'm not sure which circle, but into the category of um, using data from um, consumption apps. And um, here we also have a, this kind of new setting where, where stock rewards um, are given and we can see how that affects consumption. Okay, so bump.com. Um, so it's again, it's, a, it's an app that you can sign up for. You can link all of your checking and, and credit cards accounts. And then if you um, spend at previously selected brands, you receive stock rewards in those brands from those companies. Let me just show you a couple of screenshots. So here, for example, you have all the consumption categories like airlines, and then you can pick your favorite ones. So for example, data. So, and then you can, could have also picked United or Southwest. Or in um, burgers, you can pick Wendy's or McDonald's. Or in coffee, you can pick uh, Duncan or Starbucks. And you can only um, switch those once per month, but we're only going to use the selection upon account signup because we think that the account, the week of account signup, because people only were allowed to wait list before, um, is kind of determined by the company and not by the people. So here you can link all your cards and then you have all of your transactions and you can see here the target transaction was an eligible transaction. So I received 21 cents of target stock in response to spending $20 at target. 
Then on top of the, the account distribution, which was not determined by the people because they only signed up for the waitlist, we also used the stock grants. So people received a push, ma push message um, saying here you received $5 in McDonald's stocks. Perfect. Um, so we have all of the spending transactions by the, the users as well as the um, retail category and then the brand. And we then also we have the grants information, of course, and then the when they went on the waitlist, when they signed up on the BAMP website, when they went off waitlist, so BAMP told them that they are now allowed to sign up for an account and when they actually signed up for, for an account. So, and what we do is like, we do the usual steps to clean the data because we don't want to have, for example, cards that we only observe after account opening and not before. So we require at least two transactions per week around the waitlisted dates, the off waitlisted sign up um, and receiving the grants. And then at least five transactions in all user months pairs. So that um, brings us down from 11,000 users to uh, 10,000 users. And then we only want to use those people who sign up right away after BUMP allows them to sign up. Um, and that brings it down to like 9,000 users. Perfect. Um, so as you can probably imagine, the user population of BUMP is kind of relatively young and more likely to be male as often the case with fintech apps. So we have like 70% men and then the average age is like 36. And in terms of people spending, it is on the, so we have spending on all the brands. So, and all of that total spending monthly is around 1,500, right? And then we have, for example, the eligible spending in the grants that people picked, like when they picked Starbucks, that's the Starbucks spending. Um, and then we see exactly how many rewards do they get over the whole sample period. And then um, the eligible spending per week is um, something like um, $56. So then they receive weekly rewards of something like 40 cents on average in stocks. Right. We have, of course, a selected sample of the population, somebody that signs up for, for this app. And we could, did a little bit to compare the um, spending behavior to the representative consumer survey of the CEX. And we found some discrepancies, but they were not terrible, um, I would say, but it has to be kept in mind that these are younger, more likely to be male tech savvy people. Okay, so there's only so much we can do about it. Now, the the thing that we can do something about it and the major problem um, we want to address in this paper is that people could delay their spending until after they sign up for the bumped account and then now they start spending in Starbucks now that they get the rewards. So that is something we can, we can address. And the reason is that the people originally sign up for a wait list and then they get onboarded by bumped after spending like around five months or so on the wait list. Uh, and then we think that the actual week that BUMP gave them the account that is, that is possibly exogenous. And then on top of that, um, BUMP gave some user stock grants um, in the week that they, that they signed up. And that is also plausibly exogenous and that came perfectly unexpected. So relative to the, uh, the ideal experiment where somebody walks down the street and we hand them Starbucks stock, right, and then observe their spending afterwards. What we have here is somebody walks down the street that five months ago signed up for a bumped account or, you know, would like to, would like to become a bumped client. And so some millennial walks down the street who um, signed up for the waitlist. And then um, we know that this millennial picks Starbucks when, when it has a choice between Duncan and Starbucks. And then the experiment we have is like, what if now um, we hand them Starbucks stocks to that affects their, their spending? So this is the experiment we have here. You can see um, the data starts in March 2018 when people were started to being waitlisted and then bumped accounts got distributed. And then people, some people don't sign up immediately, so we don't want to include those people because then there's the, the concern that they may delay their spending until after they signed up. So we only use people who signed up right away. 
And then in between, they received these stock grants. Um, so that's also kind of nicely distributed um, over the, the course of the sample period. Perfect. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to run eligible spending before and after sign up on the week of sign up um, or eligible spending in a certain uh, granted brand um, on the, the, the grant distribution. And we're going to look at percentage deviation relative to people's own spending um, that is effectively controlling for individual fixed effects, but we control for individual fixed effects on top of that as well, week by year fixed effects. Perfect. Um, okay, so what do we see here? So this is people's eligible spending before, in the weeks before they um, can sign up for the bump account and then it jumps up by 40% after they um, signed up for the for the or bumped allowed them to sign up for the bumped account and this 40 percent of um, eligible spending in starbucks for example corresponds to 22 dollars uh, of increase in spending per week now in terms of the their duncan spending if they if they chose starbucks their ineligible spending we can rule out something like a $15 decrease with 95% confidence. So there does seem to be an increasing of the pie in, in marketing terms. Perfect. Um, so now let's look at the, the people who received the grant. So this is um, their jump in all, in all eligible spending around um, account opening and grant received, which is 40%. And then this is in the brands that they received the grant in, which then jumps up to around 100% or so. So people spend like 100% more in the, the, um, the brands that they received the stock grant in. So if I hand you $5 of McDonald's stock, then you spend 100% more in McDonald's the week and then also the couple of weeks after you received the, the stock grant. Okay, so we also looked a little bit at the most popular categories like grocery burgers, coffee. Um, overall, the picture looks pretty similar. There's this like pretty large uh, jump up in eligible spending and then some um, more, more mixed pictures in, in eligible spending. Perfect. Uh, when we look at longer times out, we also find very persistent effects, even six months after, after account opening, though they are only like half as much or so. So let me just show you um, one placebo test. So the concern that is that you know people are somehow delaying their spending when when they sign up, um, and so here only the the waitlist date is actually determined by the people, right? When they enter their email address in the on the bumped website. So and we looked at whether their spending is at all affected by that, and that doesn't seem to be that does not seem to be the case. So we did a bunch of robustness checks, but um, it is very visible um, in our data. There's like pretty large increase in, in eligible spending and then an especially large increase in the spending in which people received their, their grants. And what do you think, what do we think is going on? So one thing that might be going on here is gift exchange. Um, the way that Bumped works is right now it's funded by venture capital and all the stock grants and rewards are paid for by Bumped. So if anything, then people should be, um, kind of feel like gift exchange feeling towards Bumped, not the company, but it may not be obvious to them um, where the stocks come from. So for example, you saw the push notification um, they just, you know, received five dollars of McDonald's stock, um, and it didn't say this is from Bump instead of McDonald's. So there could be some gift exchange with respect to McDonald's too. So we think both of these could be the the case. Um, then there could be like some type of illusion of control. Maybe if I now own McDonald's stocks, I only want to do stuff that benefits McDonald's, and therefore I don't go to Wendy's anymore. And then there's also this, I think, um, this general idea that you know, people like to um, hold stocks that they are familiar with um, and they, that they pick themselves. And that is likely to be also be the, the brands or companies that they do a lot of their spending in. So to kind of like um, um, 
you know, build a little bit of a more of a uh, empirical foundation for this idea, we did one more thing. And that is we regressed spending in certain brands. So this is like all kinds of things, right? Like Starbucks, Duncan, McDonald's, um, from our bump users at the daily or weekly level on um, holdings of the corresponding stocks, like McDonald's, for example, also relative to all holdings of Robin Hood clients. So this is the Robin Hood um, popularity data um, that is available online. And um, so here what we find is a very large um, positive correlation between daily or weekly spending and like relative to total spending and daily or weekly holdings of certain stocks relative to, uh, to, um, to all stocks. So we can see here this is pretty large 1% more in relative holdings in the Robin Hood data translates into 17 basis points more in relative spending at um, both the daily and the, the weekly level. So, and you can, this is just a correlation, right? It's just saying that um, the people's holdings of certain stocks is correlated with their spending behavior. And basically what we, what we do in the paper is to kind of establish that there's also a causal link between holding the stock and spending at the back, right? Because we have the situation where some millennial that signed up for Bumped walks down the street and now we give them the opportunity to receive stocks when they spend at their favorite brands or we just outright hand them some stock of um, the brands they like, right? And then we see them spending more at those, at those brands. Okay, um, so I'm um, already done with my presentation, so some more time for, for questions. Um, so the answer that we are, the, the question that we are answering here is like, does receiving or owning stocks of certain brands affect people's spendings in those brands? And um, we do not have this perfect experiment that I've been talking about, but we have something that makes a, a step towards that, right? Using the transaction data from the bumped FinTech app. And what we find is that when people receive stock rewards from certain brands, they spend 40% more per week on, on those brands. And they spend 120% more in response to receiving like a $5, $5 um, stock um, outright handed to them. And that effect does not be, seem to be fully offset and ineligible spending. All right, okay. so I'm gonna stop right here. Thank you so much, um, Michaela, for a great presentation. And uh, Rinda has been uh, extremely active in answering some of the questions. So, in fact, most of the questions, but I'm just going to relay some of the questions to you because I think they are super interesting. The, the first one comes from Runjing Lu, who asks, uh, who asks uh, I wonder how the consumption effects identified here is different from those from signing up to loyalty program of a certain company. So how will the uncertainty of stock returns versus the certainty of benefit from loyalty rewards points play a role in the different consumption effects in your view? Um, so that's an interesting question that I haven't really thought about yet. So we have been thinking a little bit about how would, how would cash rewards um, differ maybe from stock rewards. And unfortunately, we don't have the data to answer that question. But yeah, it's interesting how would like other rewards that are not cash, like miles, for example, um, compare to, to stock rewards. So, so, so I don't know. Um, in terms of the uncertainty, that is the, I guess, one of the features. We could in principle look at like whether people received stock rewards and then had like positive returns versus negative returns. So we haven't really done that, but maybe that would, you know, be one way to um, like answer that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A another question coming from uh, Tobin Hanspal is asking, I think it would be interesting to understand if consumers select a company because they know they're going to spend there or because they want the stock of their company or some other reasons such as loyalty. And so, so this is something that uh, he thinks, and I agree, it's, it's a very interesting kind of path. Um, yeah, so, so, a, so what's crucial here is that is why we restrict the sample to people who sign up 
um, right after they are invited to sign up, right, which is around five months after they got waitlisted, to uh, kind of like get around the issue a little bit that people were somehow delaying their spending um, before they were able to sign up and then they spend a lot um, at, at those brands. But, but yeah, in principle, so to the extent that, you know, I pick a random week, right? And I ask somebody, okay, you're going to receive stock rewards either for Starbucks or Duncan, um, you know, and then they, and they have to answer now, right? So, and then they pick Starbucks. Um, so, right, that is a little bit, I think, just people's general, um, brand that they spend more. I think that that is literally just, um, it makes sense for them to just then pick the, either that where they, you know, happen to, but that should be random because they picked the week randomly, um, where they happen to spend a lot there or where they just generally spend more. So it's a little bit like somebody's like a millennials walking down the street that signed up for Bumped, right? And then this person prefers Starbucks over Duncan. Right, and then we we hand them Starbucks stock rewards or like a Starbucks stock grant. Yes, yes, yes. So there are two more questions, and these are questions that Verinda didn't have the chance to answer. By the way, I'm going to send you all the chat questions uh, at the end of this. But uh, so Stefan Zeisberg, Zeisberger is asking, well, he's saying interesting results, uh, and then he's saying any evidence of which types of users are particularly affected. Um, so we haven't, so we split the sample in a number of ways, but, um, but not really by demographics, um, or, or like any proxy for income. So we, we split the sample by kind of like whether somebody got waitlist, was on the waitlist for long versus not, but that shouldn't be affected by user characteristics. So we haven't really split by like male, um, versus female, for example, or, uh, rich versus poor. So we haven't done that because we felt like the whole user population is pretty homogenous, but um, we could look a little bit more into, into this. Okay, so the, the final comment is from Lian Yan, who's saying the complementarity between spending and portfolio is super intriguing. What do you think are the welfare and wealth implications of having this bumped app? I know this is kind of beyond the scope of what you're doing, but do you have any kind of thoughts on this? Yeah, so the only thing that we can say is that we can rule out likely a wealth effect. So in some way, um, because the rewards are so small, right? Like people only receive 40 cents of um, stock rewards. So we think that there's no scope for like a, a classical wealth effect in the sense that, you know, oh, maybe spending goes up because people are now more wealthy now that they receive the stock rewards. So that we can rule out. Um, in terms of more like general in terms of retirement planning and all that. I think to the extent that it makes people participate in the stock market more, right? And now we can all trade on Robin Hood and it's for free. I think in some way it is, it is good that spend, there's a link between spending and, and stock holding just because it may make people participate more in the stock market and because the stock market has been historically an amazing deal so we want people to participate more. I see, I see. Perfect. Thank you so much. And let me take a moment to thank uh, all the speakers for the great presentations. And also let me take a moment to thank Anna Cormis for making the seminar happen. I mean, taking, helping out with the logistics uh, her job has been tremendous. And then let me also take a moment to thank Rina Agarwal and John Jacobs from the Center for Financial Markets and Policy for all the help uh, with organizing these events. And um, so we have a number of new initiatives at the center. So please make sure to check our website and follow us on Twitter at, uh, at GU Fin Policy. On the website, you can find all the recorders, recordings and the summaries from the past events. And so I hope to see you next week when we're gonna be talking about robot advising. Thank you very much, everybody. Have, have a great day. <laughs>